she wrapped her newborn baby up in a garbage bag and left him in a dumpster. But were these the actions of an irrational teenager or does this interrogation reveal deeper truths? And, and I just put it to where I put it. Okay, where are we talking about? Put it where? Hey everyone, welcome to the Behavioral Arts. In this video, I'm going to do an in-depth behavior analysis of an interrogation of an ongoing case where a young woman wrapped her baby up in a garbage bag and left him in a dumpster. Now, before I say another word, I want you to know they found the baby, the baby's doing just fine. Now, I know a lot of the viewers like to analyze and form your own opinion before I begin my analysis. So that's exactly what we're going to do. I'm going to show you some clips from this interrogation and I want you to pay attention not just to all the indicators of deception that we talk about on the channel, but also in terms of deceptive emotion. How authentic do you feel these emotions are? When are they authentic? Under which circumstances? What is the focus of her conversation? Try to get an understanding of what we're seeing psychologically in this person. Just to give you a bit of context, a group of people completely randomly and thankfully found this baby wrapped up in a garbage bag left by himself in a dumpster. And uh, video surveillance identified Alexis Avila as the one who dropped off that bag. So they went and got her and brought her in for questioning. And you are now watching the interrogation that happened right there and then. Okay, can I have some toilet paper on my nose? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Just a minute. Just a minute. Okay. All right, so my name's Janet McClay. Okay? I'm Daniel Pez. I'm an investigator here with the Hospital Police Department. All right. What is your name? Alexis. Alexis. What is your full name? Alexis and Claudia. Okay. No, Somebody I by the didn't. name of Walker. Do you know anybody? A friend of yours? A school friend of yours? Walker. That I spoke with and she's the one that told me that you knew that you were pregnant. Walker. I don't and know that you Walker. did not want the child. I she's don't know a friend Walker. of yours. You don't know anybody by that name? No. No? Not a Walker. Okay. Well, that's your mom's last name. But I spoke with her and she's the one that told me, obviously, that you knew or had prior knowledge. Walker. All right. Like I said, if. You gotta be straightforward. I don't know. Okay. I swear, I don't know a walker. Okay. Okay. So, what was your next? Act? What What else you do after that? I I just left and I drove around, and and I just put it to where I put it. Okay. Where are we talking about? Put it where? I mean, obviously, I know where you went, and you didn't put. <laughs> right. Like, I had the trash bag in the car. Okay. If you couldn't tell, the car is messy. Mm hmm but I, I, I put it, I did. So and then I put, I, I put it in, I put it in the bag, I took it to the car, I, when I was in the car, I put, I had two trash bags, okay. I took one with me, which is the one that I had, mm -hmm. and then I, I put it again, and then I was, I, I drove around, and I didn't know what to do, and I just put it in there. So where did you, where did you throw the garbage bag? In the trash. In the trash? Okay, did you lock it up, seal it up? With the, the hair tie. I'm sorry? With the hair tie. With the hair tie? But I, I don't even think it stuck because it was broke. Okay. So We're you on just... the verge of breaking. Okay. You never notified your mom? Never. No, you never notified anybody? Nobody. Okay, so for you to tell me that he's... Obviously, the father of your child, you should have known when you got pregnant, right? <laughs> Honestly, not really. Not really. But you, you're able to tell me who it is, so... You well, know, he was the only one I've ever been with. A reasonable person would say that you knew when you got pregnant. Not, with all due respect, not necessarily. No. Because, I mean... Okay. So I'm just, you know, yeah, I know you give me information, obviously, but he didn't right. do anything as far as to lead you to do this, did he? Nothing? Okay. Did you just think um, you would be better off without a child because you're too young? No, I... I wait, mean, wait. Sorry, go backtrack. What do you mean? 
So there it was, quite a lot going on there in terms of body language and even verbal analysis. So pause the video and as always in the comments, let me know what you think so far. If you wanna go back and look at it, once again, there's a lot to look at. There's a couple of really good clusters of deception, but there's also a lot of stuff with her emotions going on without saying too much. A lot of stuff on the focus of her conversation. Let me know in the comments what you think so far. What are we looking at here? What did you see? It could be about things she said or things you saw in the body language. Let me know your analysis in the video, then come back and we'll dive in. Okay, now we're gonna go right back to the beginning of the interrogation and we're going to look at her behavior, some amazing clusters of deception, great tips on body language. But before we do, do me a huge favor, guys, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more amazing psychology content. So in the beginning of the interrogation, we see her sitting there for literally about 15 minutes waiting for the interrogator to come in. And I'll leave a link in the description if you wanna watch the whole thing. But this is the moment he walks in. That's where we're gonna start and there's a lot of stuff that happens right there in the beginning that's really telling. Can I have some toilet paper for my nose? Uh, yeah, I think it's... Yeah. Just a minute. All right, so... My name's Janet McClain, okay? I'm Daniel Pez. I'm an investigator here with the hospital police department. All right. What is your name? Alexis. Alexis. What is your full name? Alexis and Claudia. Okay. <laughs> It's almost comical. It's almost comical the way this starts. So the moment he walks in, she asks him for something. I think this is by design. I think it's her trying to regain control of the situation. Like you've been making me sit here for 15 minutes. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make you get something for me. So she asks for, no, hi, how are you? Nothing like that, no introduction. Immediately, can you get me some toilet paper? First thing is a demand. So he gets that toilet paper. And it doesn't seem like it's urgent, right? Because when it's urgent, you go like, you grab it and you just sort of, she takes her time, she folds it, and she waits for the moment for him to start speaking. And she has this obnoxiously loud and like, it's not just one blow, it's like blow and then that th -th 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 thing where she's like obnoxiously cutting him off with this sound. And she kind of looks at him like, almost with darts in her eyes, like sort of, I'm in charge here. He handles it like a champ, by the way. He just kind of stops talking waits a second, then restarts and immediately asks her a question. What's your name? What's your full name? So he's going, no, 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 I'm the one in charge. Now I'm gonna start by throwing you guys a really big important piece of information here that I think will benefit you in your lives quite a bit. And it's because I've seen a lot of comments online about her because of things like this or because at some point we see a serious lack of emotion or empathy. People are saying she's a psychopath, she's a sociopath, she's a narcissist. And those three things have a lot in common but I'm gonna tell you what I think she is of the three. I think she's a specific kind of narcissist. Now, when we talk about narcissist, most of us think of someone who is very vain, very full of themselves, and that is what a narcissist is. But there are three types. The first type is the one most of us are thinking of when we think of a narcissist, and it's the aptly named grandiose narcissist. This is the big showboat, the one who seems like they're really full of themselves, they're constantly have this overinflated ego. And the perfect example is if you think of Robert Downey Jr. in the Marvel movies as Tony Stark or Iron Man, that's sort of really full of himself personality. Big man in a suit of armor. Take that off, what are you? Genius billionaire playboy philanthropist. Now when that's brought to an extreme where it's toxic to the people around them, that's called a malignant narcissist. So if you've ever been in a relationship with someone whose narcissism got to the point where it was abusive to you, or you know someone in a relationship like that, they are dangerous people and they borderline the psychopath. The main difference being that they still have a fragile ego, whereas psychopaths tend to not really care that much what people think and they're, they can manipulate that very well. Narcissists still can be bruised and still ultimately are seeking approval. But there is a third kind of narcissist, one that almost no one talks about because we don't know how to recognize it as readily as the other two, and it's called the vulnerable narcissist. The reason this one's harder to identify is because it may not be obvious because they're not showing off. The vulnerable narcissist actually does like to play victim quite a lot. 
in their head, they think that they're entitled to better things than what they have, and they think they're better than other people, but they don't show it as much, and they often play victim in order to get that approval and feel better about themselves. They also sometimes knock themselves down. They're more quiet than the grandiose or malignant narcissists, and I think that's exactly what she is. There's a lot we see in this interrogation to where it's all about her. She has a complete refusal to see something from someone else's angle. It almost doesn't make sense in her head that anybody would feel more bad for the baby than for her. In her head, she's the victim here. She often plays victim. So I think she is a vulnerable narcissist. No, somebody I by didn't. the name of Walker. Do you know anybody, a friend of yours, a school friend of yours that I spoke with and she's the one that told me that you knew that you were pregnant Walker, and that you Walker. did not want the child? She's a friend of yours. You don't know anybody by that name? No. No? Not a walker. Okay. Well, that's your mom's last name. But I spoke with her, and she's the one that told me, obviously, that you knew or had prior knowledge. Wow. All right. Like I said, if you got to be straightforward. I don't know. I, don't know. Okay. I swear I don't know a walker. Okay. So during the interrogation, she told him that she found out yesterday that she's pregnant, and today she had the baby. He is challenging that by saying that he spoke to someone who said she knew she was pregnant months ago. And it's this woman called Walker who has a daughter who goes to school with her. I want you to look at the focus that she places on which part of that accusation she decides to tackle. She's really focused on this Walker thing. Let me explain what I think is happening. I think that the daughter does not have the same last name as the mother, and I do believe genuinely that she doesn't know someone by the last name of Walker. And she's really focusing on that because that's the truthful part, but she's completely ignoring the part where you knew ahead of time that you were pregnant. This is called overspecificity, but it's a specific kind of overspecificity. We often talk about how putting focus on other things is a sign of deception, but also if within a statement, you choose to focus on one specific part of that, that's also a sign of deception. So imagine if we work together and I come to you and I say, hey, Simon told me that you stole money from the cash register. The first thing you would say is, I didn't take money from the cash register, who the hell is Simon? So you'd go on the attack as to who this source is and you would say, that didn't happen. You would, you would address the part where I'm telling you you took money from the cash register. She's not denying the fact that this, she knew she was pregnant, She's denying knowing this Walker person, really putting focus on that. This is a great lesson. Whenever you're having a conversation with someone, look at where their focus goes within the topics. If they're ignoring the important part and really focusing on the, a minute detail in an attempt to try to come off as honest, that's a really big red flag. Right. Okay, what happened after that? I, I was in a panic. I didn't know what to do. Okay. I was scared. Okay. What did you do after? I, try, I, I cleaned myself and I just it, it just left it where it was and I was scared and I was trying to call my mom but I couldn't because I was so scared. I, would, I think she's going to hate me. Okay. Just, what made you think that? Just because I just turned 18. I haven't been, even been 18 for a month. And I'm the baby. Right. I understand that's a, that's a lot to take, okay, and that's why I'm here getting your side of the story. Um, okay, a lot of stuff going on in that clip that tell us what's going on in her head. First of all, a lot of psychological distancing. So we've covered psychological distancing on a lot of other videos, but this is when we choose words that put distance between us and the bad things that we do. So first of all, she keeps referring to the baby as an it. I don't think a single time she says him in this conversation, it, it, it. When we refer to people as it's, or even animals as it's, instead of him or her, we put distance between ourselves. We, we are dehumanizing the person or the animal and making it more of an object. Then she says, I left it where it was. Well, where it was, from what I understand from what her story she's saying, was in the toilet bowl. So she just left it there. So again, where it was, psychological distancing. Now throughout this interrogation, pay attention to her face when she is doing that sort of quivering, sad, crying thing. First of all, her cheeks are raised and her eyebrows are pretty flat. This is not the facial expression of sadness. Sadness is one of six emotions that is international. Every human being in the planet experiences 
six emotions the same way sadness is one of them. And what happens when you're sad is the cheeks droop, so do the eyes a little bit, and the inner corners of the eyebrows raise. This happens rarely with her. And the times it does happen is when she's talking about herself, not the baby. Like for example, in this case, the moment she talks about what her mom might say or her mom might hate her, we see those corners go up a little and we see the cheeks drop a little. She is actually sad at that thought and her voice actually quivers there for a sec. So we're seeing actual sadness at the thought of her mom being upset with her. First off, to me, this confirms my theory on vulnerable narcissists because vulnerable narcissists really care about what people around them think and their ego depends on the approval of others. So the fact that she's very saddened by the thought that her mom would disapprove of this is very telling. Speaking of vulnerable narcissist and truthful emotion, pay attention right at the end when he says, I totally understand, it's a lot to take, which is why I want your version of the story. When he validates her position, notice how quickly that expression of sadness wipes from her face. It's literally in a flash. I understand, that's, that's a lot to take, okay? And that's why I'm here getting your side of the story. Um, Real emotion does not do that. Real emotion fades away slowly because we're not controlling it consciously. This is like instantly that went away because she was like, oh, I'm getting validation here. We're good. It feeds that narcissism. All right, now he's going to ask her about the actual event to where she put him in the garbage bag and then in the dumpster. Um, there is a lot of deception indicators here, a nice big cluster. And I know you already did your analysis, but I just kind of want to tell you this going in so you could sort of look at it again through that lens. Okay, so what was your next act? What, what else you do after that? I, I just left and I drove around and, and I just put it to where I put it. Okay, where are we talking about? Put mm -hmm. it where? I mean, obviously I know where you went and you didn't put... <laughs> right, like, I had the trash bag in the car. Okay. If you couldn't tell, the car is messy. Mm hmm but I, I, I put it, I did. So. And then I put, I, I put it in, I put it in the bag. I took it to the car. I, when I was in the car, I put, I had two trash bags. Okay. I took one with me, which is the one that I had. Mm -hmm. And then I, I put it again. And then I was, I, I drove around and I didn't know what to do. And I just put it in there. Okay. Where did you go? What do you mean? Where did you drive to? JC Penney's. I was in. I lived. That, I was in that area. I was. I live in that area. Mhm. Mm so where did you? Where did you throw the garbage bag? In the trash. In the trash. Okay. Did you lock it up? Seal it up? With the, the hair tie. I'm sorry. With the hair tie. With the hair tie. But I, I don't even think it stuck because it was broke. Okay. So We're on just, the verge of breaking. So I don't even think it stayed, to be honest. I, it, like I said, it was broke. Mm -hmm. Like it was on the verge of breaking. Oh, oh, the hair tie broke. Oh, the, what is she, guys, what is she even doing in here? Let her go. The hair, see, we thought the hair tie held together. That's, what, that's why. Okay, so if the hair tie broke, obviously that's the important thing. Big cluster here. I had to write down notes. There's literally like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten things. So um, first, I put it to where I put it. Again, insane psychological distancing because where you put it is a garbage bin. So I put it to where I put it. We have the it, once again, referring to the baby, where I put it, garbage bin. Then he asks her, and where was that? Where did you put it? And she goes, what do you mean? What do you mean, what does he mean? It's a very simple question. The inability to understand a simple question very much is a contributor to a cluster. It's a mechanism to try to buy time. Like, what, what, what do you mean by that question? Can you explain that question? It's not a question that needs explaining. Where did you put it? Then, um, talks about the car being messy and the, the trash bag and all this stuff. That's not what he was asking. He was asking, where did you put the baby? That's an over amount of uh, detail, over specific. Then we get two facial touches. You guys know those facial touches. I'm always on that. So facial touch is one of the most researched indicators of deception when we see that face touching and she's got a big one she goes up here and then she totally wipes her face this is a big indication of stress um, then again we go back into that over specificity i had two trash bags i took the one with me 
and that's the one that I had and blah, blah, blah. This is insane verbal disfluency. It's not making sense. A lot of fluff, blah, 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 blah. Saying a lot of words without any, you know, giving any value. Big indicator of deception. Uh, then he asks, where did you go? Once again, what do you mean? Again, it's not a difficult question. Where did you go? If I was him at some point, because she does this a lot throughout the interrogation, I don't know what you mean, you have to tell me what you mean, and that's a huge indicator of deception. If I was him at some point, I would have said, what do you mean, what do I mean? What do you think I mean? It's a simple question. Then all the way at the end, when she reiterates three, four times that the hair tie probably didn't work, because that's what's important here. Not the baby in a garbage bag, not the baby in a garbage bin, the hair tie, that didn't work, so she's, it's totally fine. Uh, she says, to be honest, this is called a perception qualifier. Anything when we say honestly, frankly, to be honest, it's a way that we're trying to get people to think that we're honest, it's subconscious, it's called a perception qualifier, indicator of deception. Then she says, like I said, that is called a referral statement. Whenever we reference back something we said previously, that that's not something that on its own would mean a whole lot to me because I say it a lot too when I talk like, oh, like I said, like I just want to make it clear that I, you know, I'm consistent. I already said that before and I'm repeating it. In and of itself, not much, but as part of a cluster this size, just a freebie. Just, we're gonna throw that in this mess. You wrap around a newborn inside a trash in bag. I'm in panic. I, I'm, right. I just turned 18. Right, right. It's not like I've been 18 forever. Exactly, but you know, I mean, if somebody were to wrap you inside a trash can and put a tie on it, and you're not able to move, well, the tie was broke. Like I, right. could, I would be able to stick my hand in there. What do you think would have happened? What do you mean? Okay. You never notified your mom? Never. No, you never notified anybody? Nobody. Okay, so... So this is one of few times where I think the interrogator sort of went off course a little. This line of questioning is unnecessary, uh, especially for someone who said there's no judgment here. We are getting a bit of judgment here. It's also, he's not going to get any information because she's admit to what she did. He's got what he needs. He's a great interrogator, but there's just one or two parts like this where he kind of has a hard time staying on course. I kind of get it. Right at the end, he asks, uh, did you tell your parents? Did you tell anybody? I think he's trying to figure out if the parents knew, if he can also uh, press charges against them uh, because there's a lot of points during this interrogation where we get that. Uh, she says she didn't tell her parents, that's truthful, I believe her there. But then when she says she didn't tell anybody, I don't believe her because there is a good cluster of deception there. I do think she told someone. First we see an eyebrow flash. As she says nobody, her eyebrows go up like this. This is something we do when we seek approval, like when you bump into someone at the grocery store that you know, you go, hey, how are you? But also, it's a mechanism to show innocence. Notice how when someone's held at gunpoint, they might go like this, like, I'm innocent. It's open gesture, and the eyes are very telling, so we open it to be like, look, I'm not hiding anything. It's a reflex that we have. So she's doing it here as a way to be like, no, I, I didn't, I swear, look, I'm, I'm being honest. Just a quick side note, by the way, for eyebrow flashing, it's not always a bad thing. You could be talking to someone while they're telling you something, they eyebrow flash, or you say something, they eyebrow flash. It's not always a bad thing. This is such a great example as to why we need a cluster of behaviors, and one thing alone, means absolutely nothing because eyebrow flashing can happen as much in positive and truthful situations, but it can also contribute to a cluster of deception if it's seen with other deceptive behaviors. Then we see a one-sided shoulder shrug. One shoulder goes up as she backs up. Her right shoulder goes up, her left does not. When we actually don't know something, both shoulders go up and come back down. It's pretty quick, it's almost like a pop. In this case, it's this deliberate sort of one shoulder going up, and this is usually withheld information. We're not giving the full truth. Finally, we have a heavy lip lick. Usually, the other times where she licks her lips, it's a quick little dart like this. This one's heavy. It comes all the way out. We even hear it. So this is obviously a big indicator of stress. So I believe she didn't tell her parents because the first denial I felt was more truthful. But that second one, I do believe she told someone. They'll be briefing me here as we go. So last I heard, the baby's okay. Okay. So did you ever, did it ever cross your mind to let anybody know, contact law enforcement, you know, go back? I don't know. 
Okay. I was still in, still in shock the whole time when my parents got home. They, they, they just didn't tell them I was still in shock. I was just in my room. I'm actually not going to analyze that part because I feel most of you are very capable of seeing what happened there. She was told the baby is okay. Let me know in the comments. Did anybody see genuine relief? It's just a question. I want to know in the comments, do any of you feel like that was genuine relief? I'm not going to comment really on that expression. I do want to hear from you guys. But I do want to comment on this. Immediately after that, no questions. Where is he now? Can I see him? Nothing like that. Just goes right back to defense mode, making it about herself. Earlier in the interrogation, we also heard her say, I'm 18 years old. I'm just a baby. I just turned 18. I haven't been even been 18 for a month. And I'm the baby. Right. Like, I'm, I'm also a victim here. If you guys are feeling bad for that baby, I'm a baby as well. And right here, we see her go right back to that narrative. But let me know in the comments. Do any of you feel like that was genuine relief? For you to tell me that he's obviously the father of your child, you should have known when you got pregnant, right? Honestly, not really. Not really. But you, you're able to tell me who it is, so... You know, well, he was the only one I've ever been with. A reasonable so. person would say that you knew when you got pregnant. Not, with all due respect, not necessarily. Because, no. I mean... Okay. So. I'm just, you know, yeah, I know you give me information, obviously, but he didn't right. do anything as far as to lead you to do this? Did he? Nothing? Okay. Did you just think um, you would be better off without a child because you're too young? No, I... I wait, mean, wait. Sorry, go backtrack. What do you mean? Okay, another heavy cluster of deception here. First, he's asking her, um, you should have known when you were pregnant, right? And she laughs. It's a genuine laugh, a genuine smile with this sort of contemptuous head tilt, like looking down at him, down her nose. First of all, what are you laughing at? What's so funny? I, I fail to see the humor. A sweet baby boy was in a dumpster. This is no laughing matter. But second, whenever somebody mocks or laughs at the line of questioning, that is an indicator of deception. Then when she does answer, she says, honestly, not really. There's two things there. First of all, honestly. Again, remember, perception qualifier. Honestly, frankly, truthfully, perception qualifier. Second, not really. This is for me a personally, a huge pet peeve, not really, because it's not a yes and it's not a no. She's being asked, you knew ahead of time that you were pregnant, right? And she goes, not really. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean yes? Because it definitely doesn't mean no. What do you mean not really? Did you know or did you not know? Then, um, with all due respect, not necessarily. So once again, not with all due respect or simply no, but with all due respect, not necessarily. First of all, over politeness. This is something I do talk about a lot or I would say rather fluctuating amounts of politeness. For someone who blew her nose while the guy was trying to talk, with all due respect, to me sounds a little more sort of contemptuous, but it's this weird over politeness that doesn't belong there. Then again, not necessarily, which is just another version of not really. Then we see a face touch, mouth block again. Remember face touching, but also do remember mouth blocking. When we block our mouth, it's like we're trying to hold words from coming out so we have that. She's not enjoying this part of the conversation. And then at the end, he asks a brilliant question. He goes, did you feel like you'd be better off without this baby? He's offering a scapegoat and she kind of gets caught in, she says, no, I didn't. Then she realizes that, oh my God, by saying that, I've just removed any alibi or any excuse I had for doing this. Because she spent this entire interrogation saying, I didn't know what to do, I was confused, you know. And now it's like, no, I didn't think I'd be better off without the baby. He caught her in that and she goes, hold on, wait, back up. What do you mean? Once again, asking him to clarify a very simple question, she was caught right there hard. So he got her bad in that moment. So there it was. I hope you guys enjoyed this, despite it being such a dark and grim situation. I'm sorry about that. I keep telling myself I'm going to do lighter, funner content, like do analysis of reality shows or game shows or things that are a little more light, but then things like this are just falling on my lap and it's such a great lesson and it's ongoing. We'll be able to keep an eye on this. Maybe I'll do a follow-up video, but for right now, she's not in jail. She's in house arrest with a lot of very strict conditions and we'll see how this progresses. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this 
and I will see you on the next one.